right, welcome all, welcome all. We got one of the two Asher brothers, the lovely podcasters in the studio today. Welcome back, Kirk. <laughs> hello, 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 sir. <laughs> He's ripping more shirts than Captain Kirk himself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm your host, Sully, and once again, uh, this, this is a long time coming. We were just back and forth, back and forth, and like, like all our topics, sometimes yeah. they take months. And people think, oh, it wouldn't be simple. And like, well, not if you're doing research and trying to add all your notes. And <laughs> yeah, when life finds a way, and suddenly you're moving, or <laughs> oh yeah, I... or, or your equipment dies on you, or something like that. And mm-hmm. you're like, oh. yeah, the, this first part of last year was awful. And same thing with this <laughs> year. I had some insomnia attacks, and I was just like, okay, I got enough for the next few months so i'm gonna figure out what the hell this is otherwise i'm not gonna be able to function and sure enough got <laughs> figured out but you, you can't you, you gotta always kind of brace for impact and same thing with podcast topics i, I see some people who want to do a patreon but they're not willing to do what their patreons are asking so i'm like well then save yourself some time and don't do it if you're not going to do <laughs> yeah, exactly. honor your agreement um i exactly I, I, again, you know, you, you host the podcast NYPD Blue Balls, and you've done some other podcasting work, and you know, been on the show before. But I, <laughs> I, I, I never get sick of just kind of your insight into societal uh, commentary and <laughs> political disruptions, as well as just kind of talking about how uh, just the disintegration of characters, as well as just little minor, just like well-intended stuff that just kind of came off as outdated or not completely fleshed out you know and uh, i i sometimes will say to my parents and they'll be like what are you talking about i'm like okay I, this is a plot mechanism yeah. this is a narrative issue uh plot device that's when a character just feels like they serve the story but they're kind of forcing it not fully developed you know <laughs> yeah i actually had that conversation with my uh with my dad recently we were just talking about movies and i had mentioned how I had somehow watched that new Batman movie a lot more than I expected to because of how long it is. And he's like, yeah, that was just boring. And then I started to go into all the history (laughs) of what I like about Batman and why I like this movie and why it compares to certain types of Batman that we've seen and others. And, and then he's like, I don't watch movies like that. And then I was like, yeah, that's why this seems like a weird conversation to you. <laughs> like you don't, you, you don't uh, examine and over-examine very small things in movies. Um, Sometimes but yeah, it but, seems like they'll just people will just bottle up if they just find it absurd. I'm like, well, you still have to figure out why it's absurd. You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I have family members who do not get any of the social commentary in Planet of the Apes. They just, you know. <laughs> you know, they don't get that it's an allegory for slavery or racism and uh just rebellion and they, they just think oh stupid you know awful gorilla movie or they have just seen other versions of it and they assume that's the go-to i'm like oh no yeah and because they find it so you know annoying and dumb they you can't even get through to them so i'm just like okay Way to kill the fun here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Planet of the Apes is another good example where I, I remember well, I remember watching that first one. Um, I want to say like three or four years ago. Oh, that's maybe fine. five. Hey. <laughs> but yeah, I remember watching it for the first time and I was like, oh wow, this is this is really great and has a lot to say about humanity, how it views other species and itself, how it views its own evolution. And then when I saw it was written by, or at least co-written by Rod Serling, I was like, oh. That's why that's it's why. very Twilight zone <laughs> yeah. That's why this is so good. Uh, this is a very thoughtful, very um, intentioned writer, a guy that wants to make a clear point in the stories that he writes. So I was like, oh, that's why this is a very well-written, very interesting movie. Um, but yeah, and then you watch Tim Burton and you're like, Wow. That's a that's a real big swing and a miss, man. Um, oh man, yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks for that experience. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that was, that was oh, fun. For... I feel like he almost did it just so he wouldn't have to do sequels or something, or he didn't want to <laughs> do it to begin with. That there are times where you'll see. I mean, we kind of get into it with just other filmmakers, like, uh, like 
some of the superhero ones were good because they chose to not play it inch by inch of the source material. They did kind of a sarcastic take on it. Uh, you, mm-hmm. you have, I mean, Nicholas Meyer did one of some of the best Star Trek movies because he didn't play it to the formula. He just did a good movie first and added the characters where they mm-hmm. needed. And uh, it is wild how some people will say this doesn't work here, but it does it. It does work here, but then they forget about previous criticism mm-hmm. and acting like it never oh, existed yeah. because it doesn't serve their agenda. And it's like, no, no, no. And I mean, some of these shows we're going to talk about, uh, I mean, there's no shortage of it. We've seen people bitch about them, but not really know what they were about or kind of just disagree with them just because they didn't like the jury outcome, so to speak. <laughs> Mm-hmm. They did one oh, yeah. thing they consider unrealistic. So, oh, well, uh, it's not a good show. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> yes, it's not good at all because of one thing I didn't like. Um, How dare you? So, uh, we <laughs> we got we got four books to review here today, and you know we we've been doing a lot more of this lately, talking about screenplays and comic book spinoffs, and just you know everybody's had it. Uh, uh, you know, it's not just movies and shows that are based on a comic. You know, there there's so many of them that continue their narratives that are really worth uh, reading. Everything from Blade Runner and RoboCop to Hellraiser and uh, uh, just uh, uh, numerous just anthologies and uh, Alien versus Predator is another big one. You know, and some of them do really good in book form, but the ones in comic form are always interesting because even if you don't really find the dialogue notable or the ending kind of is fast paced you know again the artwork and ideas are just if they Mm -hmm. land with you that that's that's worth it alone regardless of the pricing Um, yeah for real so first up on the docket uh we in 04 there was this book by mystery novelist j madison davis that adapted uh, an original standalone uh, mystery for the original Law and Order TV show, and uh, I'll go into it real fast. Uh, I I could not put it down. I am not even <laughs> kidding. I, I it was a good standalone novel while really feeling like the person had watched enough episodes or gotten some approval from producer Dick Wolf's people on how to handle all the different characters. Um, uh, mm-hmm. it was it was quite all right, and there was some good detail to the signature dialogue. It was a slightly rough beginning, <laughs> and uh, it, re- it, it, it the mystery uh reveals uh a book of a troubled hedge fund guy who might have been incriminating himself and his ex wife's murder as well as his finances. And among the other findings, there's this Doug guy who says that there was also a questionable finder's fee and that the suicide note by the victim might have been affected by one of the other culprits. Contains appearances by Lieutenant Van Buren, uh, attorney Jack McCoy, his ADA, Serena, uh, and the main district attorney, Arthur Branch, uh, as well as, and our main detectives at that time were Briscoe and Green, and so they are the main ones going back and forth, having their usual cynicism and <laughs> remarks on how this doesn't add up to much, or it's just too clean. And I, I most of the dialogue really doesn't get too edgy. There's a brief, mild use of shit, but I've kind of seen stuff that where you could probably hear something like that. But uh, even uh, the psychiatrist Emil Skoda and fire detective uh, Mike Logan were even mentioned. So there's a mild continuity error because they're claiming, hey, he's writing a book and he might be retiring. Uh, but you know, <laughs> it was not to be as he appeared later on the Criminal Intent show. <laughs> but uh, it, mm-hmm. it it makes no shortage of also mentioning other uh, pop culture in there, just like the actual show would. They even mention uh celebrities like ice tea so i'm like oh, okay awesome they someone just felt cool to break the fourth wall i mentioned an actor who <laughs> actually plays a character on the show um a franchise um 
and then next up on the docket uh but yeah no it was a really lovely read you can probably get it very affordable and i i got it on some of my pds pdf servers and i i might as well have bought it but uh this bring it, it it really will entertain those who are looking for a good standalone mystery as well as hmm. show completists so good rare very rare um uh just accomplishment um yeah jam nice. really. and so i'll go briefly into the next one and that'll lead us up to the main uh reason uh you're, you're here <laughs> um uh, we uh so there was a book based on the tv show bones and bones. i found it i found it funny because i was like uh so the show based on a show <laughs> well based on a book <laughs> it became a spin-off book with the new <laughs> characters playing the characters okay got it um mm. but yeah kathy rikes <laughs> was the main gal who did all the coroner examination dna testing at you know it was a show filmed in canada but it was you know based in you know washington and um uh, yeah, so it, it it's set at the Jeffersonian Institute, and you know our main characters, Bones and Agent Booth, are going after a plastic bag of skeletal remains, uh, uh, related to a case involving a Chicago mob family, and a chilling note is left on the steps of the federal building, and violent twists and bloody discoveries as the novel indicates it's written by max allen collins who many will know as the <laughs> author of the road to perdition book and graphic novel series that later became a movie as well as uh just numerous other just uh book and uh comic tie-ins to various uh movies and tv shows as well as his own original thrillers and sci-fi material um i vary on him i i do not in any way shape or form think he's a hack or anything i think he's quite talented actually um now this one never really ignited for me um again mm. uh the name of it uh, is once again um uh bear, bones buried deep <laughs> and uh you know i much like that subtitle i just didn't really feel like it was quite firing at all the seams. Now I, I've seen <laughs> other tie-ins Max has done. He's written some CSI comics and novels, and those are okay. And I read his uh, Criminal Minds books, and again, this is kind of like those where it's half firing on the cylinders, but it's not quite cutting the mustard. I don't. Mm -hmm. It's not going to appeal at all to anyone who hasn't seen the show but i just didn't feel like the characters were even talking like they talk no yeah that's that's a big thing because <laughs> I, I, i've read so many other books that are awesome that are based on tv shows like the show 24 and mm -hmm. those had different authors and some of them would get distracted or just kind of be like a james bond encounter where fun idea not good use of your time or mm. outcome or kind of a weak villain there but otherwise a good read and uh this was kind of like that where i just felt like it was an uninspired read it was fast paced it was very heavily detailed there was some out of place profanity you got f-bombs galore with the chicago guys and i'm like guys if you are <laughs> sometimes it's okay like i like how the new star trek shows have gotten grittier and for a mature audience but see they warned that they kind of earned that they kind of already had kind of a mature audience and they're just going up the next level but here with this i'm like you know okay so it's a gritty show but it was otherwise you know for young adults and teens you know and it was a mixture of kind of very witty office drama with some soap uh soapy mystery and even some funny easter eggs for sci-fi horror geeks you know so i <laughs> i don't the profanity really didn't do anything for either the character development of these characters that we'll never see again or and it's trying to get very unhinged and intense and there's just too much reliance on the viewer's knowledge of the show like mm. uh, uh, uh sometimes 
these books really will do good use of show giving you an idea of what's inside the character's head but there was a little too much of that here and uh so i can't uh, recommend it unless you are once again you you got to get everything related to the show watch all the movies with the actors you know all that so it's yeah it's, you got to yeah. you can probably get it very cheap now but that, that's on your discretion you probably would just be better off just watching reruns on TNT 24/7 <laughs> again uh, so this brings us oh, to yeah. our main uh, uh, object of oh, yeah. discussion. Uh, so these books were expensive as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I got a funny story about that, too. So I sure. so we're talking about uh, Max Allen Collins also wrote two books that these two are books, some of his first tie in stuff yeah. <laughs> like it, these these two books that are tied into the world of nypd blue a, a police one's drama, a prequel procedural. one's later like yeah three seasons in <laughs> well yeah it, the first one acts the first one blue beginning acts mm-hmm. like a prequel almost to the very moment of the pilot absolutely it really gets right up right up to the end of it and then, and then the blood. second one, yeah. Blue Blood, is based in between season two and three. Okay. So, yeah. so Sipowitz has his new par- partner, Simone, but he doesn't know if he can trust him fully yet because he hasn't spent a lot of time with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is but there is this kind of friction between them because now Sipowitz questions if he really should have trusted john kelly his first partner which was david caruso in the first season yep um and john kelly in the first book um so it kind of creates an immediate friction between these two partners in the in the second book which i thought was really well used in that second book um because because there's so much there's so much to say about these tie-ins only because um, as as you may have mentioned uh, at the top of the show, or if you remember me being on a previous um, Woo, yes. episode, <laughs> we, uh, my brother and I do a podcast where we talk about every single episode of the show. And there's been 12 seasons. There's over 250 episodes. Mm-hmm. And, and while the quality, you can argue the quality may have changed, the tone has kind of always been consistent on that show. Mm-hmm. So, so my biggest worry reading these books, I was like, if this guy doesn't hit the tone, then he's already in so much trouble because there have been up episodes and down episodes, but the tone has always been consistent and you always kind of left feeling like, oh, I watched an NYPD Blue episode. There's no filler. There's no, oh, that didn't seem right. Mm-hmm. So, so I was like, okay, let's start these books. And I will say I was pleasantly surprised that in my mind, it matches the tone of the show. It is, yep. it's not so much a mystery as it is, what is the process to find out the information we already kind of know is true? It kind they of plays a, a lot like his yeah. Mike Hammer uh, books in a way. I don't know if anyone's read those, but I mean, he did the <laughs> Query, which was uh, also a neo-noir-ish kind of, XCon on the run show which later became a cinemax show and same kind of deal here he he does love enriching a lot of detective stuff and uh i i must uh compliment this as well well as you said in that he he definitely feels like he knows every inch of these characters de- detailing everything from they're getting ready for work versus something's on their mind and <laughs> Yeah, give me a little of that heavy grit. And 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 the one thing, because as as I was reading them, I was like, okay, I'm pleasantly surprised. And, and you were talking about kind of the cursing and um, the dialogue. And the <laughs> only thing, the only thing that Max Allen Collins does that would immediately take me out of what I was reading is because I've seen and because I've seen the show so much. Every single scene he writes, I already know exactly what it looks like. But then he'd have a character curse in a way that they have never done in 12 seasons of a show. And that one moment immediately would take me out of it. And it was so weird that I didn't realize it. But the second the Sipowitz character uses the F word, it's like, 
ever. He's never used it. <laughs> he said some horrible things. I totally he missed that. Some... <laughs> <laughs> he, he says some horrible things. He says some racist things, homophobic things, um, transphobic things, tons of horrible things. But he's never yeah. used the F word. So, And he's also never used the word baby. And in the second book, he uses it like four times. And I was like, oh, it just seems weird to imagine Dennis Franz saying that to a woman. Like, it, it doesn't seem right. It, it, so only those moments I was like, okay, that was a little weird. But everything else... Unless he was a different way... character before the pilot. I, I don't think it's, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was, it was an odd one. But, um, but you were right. It, it's clear that Max... Alan Collins, it's, it's he has such a perfect three three name name. Um, <laughs> you can tell that Max Alan Collins was was trying very hard to not disappoint people who like that show, um, because it would have been so easy to just kind of turn in a generic. Oh, here's just some hardened detectives. Here are their problems, and not really go into who they are. Where I feel like. When you watch the very beginning of NYPD Blue, the pilot, Sipwitz is a train wreck. Oh yeah, and you have, to, and you have to you have to figure out a prequel story that somehow shows him as someone who can be redeemed, but is also a train wreck. And mm -hmm. he somehow he somehow merges his alcoholism with a story of him trying to help an underage girl get back to her family, who may be tied up and. The pornography business and it's it's like wow he's such a good guy and then when something terrible happens to that girl it's like of course he would start drinking he like finally gets a leg up into doing something right and then it all falls apart around him like yep. the rest the rest of the show <laughs> happens to go so like it makes sense it adds up and then like i mentioned it leads right into the beginning of the pilot which was which was i thought a great job i thought he did a good job doing but yeah, I checked um, out. Um, I thought this was a little stronger in the second book, Blue Blood. Because mm. now we have... He's not really trying to even reference all events. He's just trying to do a cool standalone mystery. Yeah. Were... Someone has tried to yeah. kill his new wife, Sylvia, the attorney. It was... Because, um, yeah, the, the second book is someone breaks into his and his new wife, his newlyweds home mm -hmm. and he fights them off. And then the entire book, they assume it's this recent millionaire that got out of a murder charge. Yeah. It turns out to be, it turns out to be someone from Sipowitz's past, mm -hmm. but it, I, I, when I first read both of them, I was like, huh, I like the second one more than the first. And then when I kind of skimmed through them again for the for the podcast, <laughs> I realized like no, I think I like the first one better only because the second one does two very strange things. It makes Sylvia Costas, who is Sipowitz's wife, jealous of Russell, thinking that something oh, was going yeah. on. I forgot about between that. <laughs> and I was like, that feels like that would never happen. Like that seems like something that. Like one thing Sylvia is never really been is jealous of Sipowitz, um, or someone that Sipowitz might be talking to. That doesn't make sense. And it also led to a very funny line <laughs> where and when I saw it again, I laughed out loud because Sipowitz in a sarcastic tone says to Sylvia, Yeah, that's right, Sylvia. Um, I'm waiting for you to get out of the picture so I can date a woman half my age who's into dudes who look like me. And I'm like, well, when you get to the last three seasons, you do date a woman that's half your age that you would quit. <laughs> and it's played like it's totally normal, which is so weird. Um, and then the other thing was they have Simone. Uh, Simone is uh, bodyguarding a woman who or is the daughter of the man that they suspect oh, was he doing security work on the side i know he did it briefly but he kind of got away from it when he saw how shady some of the other guys were <laughs> yeah and and when he did that it almost felt like that was almost a step too far for simone like simone he'll he'll kind of color outside the lines and go outside of policy 
But the fact that he did that on his own and didn't tell anybody, I was like, wow, that seems like way out there. Like that's a really big it's reaching. <laughs> <laughs> like that that seems like a real easy way to get fired cuz that's compromising the case, it's compromising yourself, it's compromising your partner, your boss. Like it really seemed like that seems too far. And then the book kind of like NYPD Blue itself does. They found an excuse to get him half naked with a woman that felt super forced <laughs> where it was just like what? They're gonna she's gonna try and have sex with this man in her childhood bedroom? Like that seems very weird. Um I mean there probably would have been something ironic like that, but it would have probably been revealed after the fact and there would have still been a bigger lead up to it. So yeah, I'm with you. It seems like they kinda were casually watching the show in that respect and just again trying to force it into the plot and like mm. <laughs> It's not how these yeah, typically it, work. Say what you want about the content itself, but that's not how we lead into this and, typically. And and you uh you mentioned um that it does seem to tie in well. And even though the second book is not as strong as the first one, I do think Blue Blood kind of works very well in between the second and third season. Um only because it highlights a very important thing, which is John Kelly is gone. They actually, they take a lot of time in that book to kind of talk shit about him indirectly. <laughs> um, like it's, pretty, it's pretty directed that, that they're just like, yeah, you think a guy you were with for seven years would show up to your wedding, but apparently not. And you're like, okay, well, <laughs> we're talking about him a lot. Um, but they... <laughs> They do highlight a very important thing, which is Sifwitz is still trying to get into the idea of making new friends in yeah. his like re redemption arc. Like he's trying to be close to people, and it's setting up Simone and Russell, which becomes the the real big will they won't they romance of the show at that time. Mm -hmm. But they do it in kind of a they do it in a good placeholder way because this is a this is a book that takes place between between two seasons of television. So, just the way those work, you have to have kind of a uh, oh, what's the word? You have to have a cliffhanger, and then the second the next season starts, you got to remind everybody about what's important. But nothing really important happened in between that time, <laughs> so it's kind of. So, so it has to be a very weird middle ground where it's like, it has to be an interesting story, but nothing super notable happens that they would ever talk about in the season and yet pays off to their character development. So I was like, that's a, that's a precarious position to be in. And the guy did a decent job with, uh, with what he had. Um, totally. I, I'm with you. He, he didn't feel like he was doing this half-assed. I can't justify the pricing. Way, mm. I don't know why these became collector's items and you know. Yeah, that story I gotta tell. So, oh man. I let my dad bar I let my dad borrow these. Um because oh, he, he really likes he really likes the show. And I was like, yeah, you should give them a read. I mean, they're not amazing, but I think they're pretty cool. And I let him borrow the first one. And then when we met back up, I said, Okay, um and he gave you me the first him? one back. I was like <laughs> He said uh, he uh, he gave the first one back, and I said, "Okay, cool. Start on the second one." And he goes, "You never gave me the second one." I was like, "Yeah, I did." <laughs> and also, everybody at this point is in a state of like moving, so all their stuff is in boxes. It's not where they thought it was. Everything's topsy turvy. So I go, "Yeah, I did." He's like, "No, you did not." And I was like, "Well, I mean, it was a little expensive on Amazon. Let me see if there's another copy." And I pull out my phone, go to Amazon, and it was like two hundred and thirty dollars. And I was like, "Yeah, we're gonna find we're gonna find this book if I have to tear open everything I own <laughs> to find this book, because there is no way I'm spending two hundred and thirty dollars on a two hundred page." Uh, Fruit uh, Books was a good help, but there were some other ones where I had to keep kind of just climbing through. And then I ordered one, and then it says, "Oh, out of stock. You got to buy another different one." I was like, "What the hell?" So eBay helped out a bit, but. I, I doubt most fans even know that there are books of this, you know, unless you were then and there an avid TV and 
watcher and reader back in the day? I think it must it must just be um mystery uh, completus. It must be that and just basic supply and demand where it's like they didn't make a lot of these. So if you really want one, you're going to have to pay up the big bucks because whoever has it knows that you're not going to get it anywhere else. So <laughs> it because I, I remember I remember seeing them on Amazon when I first bought them. And I was like, OK, that's a little expensive. But, you know, I have all the DVDs. I have a podcast based on this. We're what's watching a little it on bit streaming extra... nonstop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like what's what's a little extra money for this? And I got both of them and then they went up like, well, I don't know, six times that amount in the yeah. year that I own them. And I'm like, oh shoot, that's that's crazy. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it also means I definitely gotta I definitely gotta keep them <laughs> and I gotta keep them safe, uh, just in case. Um yeah. I mean, it it's... was an interesting experiment. It wasn't a must do, but I was anything to get you back on here. But it was also just fun to just kind of see is like, hey, this was the typical kind of tie-in thing back in the day. <laughs> and it it is a it is an interesting I, I did find it interesting that they didn't continue or at least kind of shift focus on these, only because it feels like N NYPD Blue had such a, it had such a dense and then rich, like universe, that you could have easily said, "Hey, write a book about internal affairs in Martens." Like yeah. he shows up, he shows up at absolutely random times throughout every season. It's an interesting character, and. Mm -hmm. And whatever you write doesn't have to take place with these characters. I did notice that this... briefly, and I was like, I would have liked a little more. Show us the internal affairs department, I guess, you know, and the TV show Brooklyn South builds on some of those same internal affairs guys and other minor characters like the snitch guy and uh, criminal informant. But, you know, most not everyone saw that awesome Stephen Bochco show. So it would, like you say, it would have been cool to kind of maybe even get a comic book back in the day that expanded some of the universe a bit. <laughs> and also like, I think about, I mean, I don't, I don't remember what year the book was published. Uh, but... First one was uh, pretty much 94 came out around the same time as a year after the show. And this one, I saw one site claiming 95 and another one claimed 97. So, uh... <laughs> but, but you figure, I mean, at that time, People were. It was happening. Yeah. People were reading. They're definitely they were definitely reading books a lot more than they are now. It's complimentary, uh, yeah. And and you figure, NYPD Blue kind of when it first came out, it was very very popular and it was very uh, it was part of the zeitgeist where like everybody was talking about it because it was before the internet like <laughs> fractured all of our attention spans. Yeah, but. No kidding. <laughs> but the uh, but the idea that they that these books must not have done well enough to justify continuing them, it just kind of seems unfortunate because like this seems like a pretty easy way to make a little bit of money on this brand and get more stories out of it that you couldn't do on TV for I mean obvious reasons. There's cursing and the violence can be a little more explicit. Um, right. It was in that rare zone. I mean. There were plenty of other things at that time, like from uh, UPN or Fox would try a sci-fi horror anthology. Uh, the X-Files spinoff Millennium was so gruesome at times that they barely would show it, you know, during the day just because it, it, they were just afraid of repercussions. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's an interesting just kind of gray area now that uh, now people have no problem with having uh implying that people are half naked or having a violence at a crime scene but they they won't push the language envelope they'll go into political or social topics but they gotta i, I think criminal minds is one of the few who can do that but then there's like some other ones that are just like ooh, yeah if this wasn't highly rated i don't think they'd go there <laughs> yeah the it, it was and it was interesting because these do these stories in particular they do have kind of, they have a specific time in the 
the television run to like hook themselves onto. So mm-hmm. as soon as you get done, as soon as you get done with Blue Beginning, you can watch the pilot. And I I did that just to see what it's, it's a like. Good companion it is, piece, yeah, yeah. And it's also strange how you're, I'm watching it, and then it gets to the first NYPD Blue sex scene, and it's very, very cheesy. Yeah, and, and the saxophone in that is too much. <laughs> and and watching that, and I'm like, man. And then I I remember very vividly coming home one day, and my roommates were watching American Horror Story. Uh, and it was the se- and it was the season about um I think there was a serial killer attacking gay men in New York. Oh, I thought that was every and, season. <laughs> and and there was a scene that's just nearly hardcore gay <laughs> simulated sex. As you expect and from I wa- Ryan Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> and I walk in and I look at that and I'm like, and they were so mad at NYPD Blue when it was it, it was always so tender. And cheesy and weird and like soft filtered and, yeah. and like silly. <laughs> and now we're at this age where it's like that's that was just on television at one point. Um uh, and now you've seen more people... violence on a soap opera. Yeah. It it's interesting <laughs> how people are watching the same thing but through different lenses and everything. It, it's wild mm-hmm. how you gotta kind of sugarcoat it a bit. I mean, Star Wars oh, is yeah. a freaking uh toy commercial because there's all this nostalgia <laughs> built up from it all these years ago people want to make it something different you know oh yeah and yeah. I, I, um, it's, I i think it's some of the same it, it's interesting how fx will do something gruesome or edgy and yet people want to act like it's something different than that <laughs> it's just like I, I don't know guys <laughs> it's it's really it's, not that yeah. different <laughs> not really and and it's also because these the things that we read, it, it's so specific to a specific time in media where they're like, we have something popular, let's branch out. You know what's hot? Novels. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> now it's like, you know what's hot? Like TikTok tie-ins or, <laughs> um, you know what you know what's hot right now? Uh, influencers talking about your show. Um, in 45 second increments while they're eating Taco Bell and sponsored by Taco Bell hashtag right and it's just so funny that like especially NYPD Blue it's such an it's such a specific time and then we're kind of we have these modern takes on it with podcasts and we're reading kind of to kids nowadays, I say kids. To kids nowadays, it's like we're talking about um, like terrestrial radio. It's like, wait, they had physical paperback novels based on your television show, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, we read them. Like, we didn't listen to them as a podcast series. We 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 read them, um, <laughs> and we talked That's about them. All at we work. had to gleam off of, yeah. <laughs> You didn't chat in them at your work from home job? No, we went to a physical place. Um, yeah, it's just uh, it, it's just insane. Um, and I, I said it before, but it's a bummer. It's a bummer that Max Allen Collins didn't get to make more. I kind of wish uh, there could have been more stories based on some later season stuff, um, or more. Uh, some, or if he had a, another crack at Simone, kind of get that character maybe nailed down but yeah uh, I, I mean half the time i don't even know what is meant to generate a good sell half the time <laughs> these different books and everything i mean uh i have pals on this other podcast called the shattered shield which examines the similar you know edgy show the shield and oh, yeah. like you guys they did a good job of talking about just other pop culture savvy stuff instead of just relying on have you or have you not seen the show and uh, it was good at just, they do a good job of also kind of outlining that half the time when someone does a tie-in no one really has a set expectation either and so you're just like so uh, <laughs> what did you yeah. want from this <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and um i think with with age uh because i remember i remember when i was younger and i would get so passionate about 
um, <laughs> iterations of Batman or uh, sequels to this or part like franchises doing this. And, and as I got older, I, I kind of cooled down on that. And I, I have more of a, let's see what they do, and then let's just be honest about how we feel about it. But let's not attack them or attack what they did exactly. Right. But just be honest not about me. what it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> unless, unless they do something, like, horrendous. But, you know, the Joel Schumacher nipples and uh, uh, Tim Burton's um, lack of plot in Planet of the Apes, like, that type of... <laughs> That type of stuff you're allowed to get a little hyperbolic and and kind of <laughs> shit on as as people say because it's it's bad it's horrible but with something like this I was like good on them for keeping the tone um, keeping it interesting uh, you mentioned that you couldn't really put the first book down the Law and Order one yeah once very once tight. I like once I got into the plot of this, which starts really fast, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to keep reading until it's over <laughs> because it felt, it felt to me like, Oh, it's, it's like a movie length version of an episode, which is, yeah. which is something I always would want anyway. So why not, <laughs> why not finish it? Why not make just um, of that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Uh, do you have anything uh, upcoming you'd like to promote as well? Oh, yes, absolutely. So um, NYPD Blue Balls is out every other Tuesday uh, where you find a podcast, but every Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and uh, Monday night, I'm streaming over at Twitch, twitch.tv slash Kirk Has Glasses. Um, and uh, I don't know when this will come out. I imagine it'll come out after this happens. So I'll, <laughs> I'll leave a break point, but... Um, on November 4th of this year, I'm going to be participating in Extra Life, which is uh, a streaming event where people stream for 24 straight hours to raise money for Children's Miracle Network. So all the money goes to children's hospitals. Um, and this year, on November 4th, I'm going to be doing a 24-hour stream watching 24 hours of public domain movies. Ooh. Um because on uh, on the stream on Mondays I usually watch a public domain movie, and on Wednesdays and Sundays I play video games. And so I'm watching all of the best movies I've seen so far on the stream. I'm rewatching them for 24 straight hours. So uh, if anyone's available, Twitch.tv/slash Kirk Has Glasses, um, November 4th all day, and then Mondays, Wednesdays, and Sundays. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah, you guys are into so many other big di different movies and shows and i promise we'll have you on for those as well but um <laughs> uh, uh isn't it interesting how people can kind of choose what they want to do when they want to you know there's never really oh a gosh. rush you know if you love something enough you know you're going to cover everything uh, whenever yeah and one of the uh <laughs> Because I think I mentioned it. It's so weird because I think we mentioned it on the, the first time we were on the show. But mm -hmm. I have re I have rewatched that Batman movie, the Robert Pattinson Batman movie, only because it's on HBO Max, <laughs> and because I can throw it on thinking like, oh, I'll just have it on in the background. And next thing I know, I watch all three hours of it. <laughs> um, and how that's so different. <laughs> like, because even even thinking about the physical media, like. If you wanted to watch Titanic, you still had to put in a VHS and take it out and put in a different VHS. Like the <laughs> there there was a time where it wasn't so easy to just be scrolling through HBO Max, Hulu, uh, any one of those streaming services and just go like Ernest goes to camp. I haven't <laughs> seen that and forever that can't possibly hold up i'll just put it on all I, have to do is, <laughs> all I have to do is press play and next thing you know you're watching movies that maybe shouldn't exist anymore but they're just available uh on these random streaming services and um it's it's a uh, it's insane what you might get into what you might get passionate about all of a sudden so yeah, yeah and there's no right or wrong way to go about it either i mean if you want to mm have it on in the background and then watch it again the next day with closer examination. That'll definitely have it. 
<laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but this has been a delight having you on and I uh, absolutely. Uh and all together, I mean, I I I hope podcasters even get comfortable just doing more fun collaborations. I've seen uh no i i see some people who are like shy to be on someone else's show and it's like well it's gonna really get really lonely there <laughs> <laughs> well yeah it's a like i've had um I, I had an old friend of mine reach out to be on their show i was like oh, i'll just give it a shot and then once things die down i could be here and it's also you know that's really the only way you can keep it interesting, I think, because most of, most of us we get into our grooves and then it's just that groove for a couple of years. It's and next thing you know, you're like, <laughs> like, oh yeah, I've been doing the same thing over and over. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, hopefully, hopefully, we, it, it um, promotes more synergy, as corporate speak would say, uh, synergy and and uh, and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you want to come out of your show once in a while and keep the voices fresh and new. And those mm -hmm. guests that just steal the show, you know, I, I see some people getting intimidated. I'm like, it's not, they're not threatening your insecurity. There's nothing to be jealous about. They're just, <laughs> we're a damn good guests to have on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you always got to just shoot the shot. You never know what you uh, might find out. Yeah, it's not it's not a contest. <laughs> it really isn't. <laughs> if it was a contest, I mean, ninety nine point nine percent of us are already losing, so you might as well lose having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, why not? Why not? Uh, but all together, I mean, uh, it it's just. It's, there's something to be gained from just having a fun sit down. You you will remember that conversation till the end of time. You'll be like, hey, I hope someone else can hear it because you know, again, this is like radio, but you can listen to it whenever. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, trust. Yeah, my buddy's uh, my buddy's show, which is the link, the link dot fm. Um, they they tried to model it after like terrestrial radio, where all their guests are actually call-ins. And uh, I couldn't help myself making jokes about how hilarious it is to <laughs> model it after a medium that <laughs> that the medium you're currently using kind of killed in some ways. Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're on terrestrial radio, which almost doesn't exist anymore um, <laughs> due to podcasts like the one you're listening to. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, you never know what kind of conversation you could have and what kind of what kind of fun could be had. Oh, well, and why deny yourself some fun as long as you don't, uh, and I think it's a bit of a skill. You, I think half of us should be able to get to that point where we know not only what are our passions coming alive, uh, but also, you know, it's like, hey, have we, you should be able to kind of gauge we got a little deep there versus we got really off topic. <laughs> yeah, true. For sure, sure. Um, I think that's I, I think that's one of the reasons uh, one of the reasons that the NYPD Blue Show happened um, was because we we used to have a show where we would talk about anything, and then those would kind of meander, and we wouldn't really have a point, and then sometimes it would kind of just bring the whole show down. <laughs> and then I noticed, and then I noticed every time we talked about NYPD Blue, we'd end up rewatching it. We'd talk about specific episodes and characters, and then it was like, well, why don't we just shift it to that? Because as far as I know, nobody's talking about it, but it does right? deserve it in some in some way. It does deserve at least somebody going through it and talking about its flaws and its achievements, and and it was. Uh, I mean, year, years into it, it's like, yeah, it's still interesting to talk about. It's still, um, and one thing that, that started happening, I want to say two weeks ago, um, NYPD Blue celebrated the 20th anniversary of its pilot. Oh, lovely. Um, 
and 20 or 30, oh my gosh, I think it's 30, 30th anniversary of the pilot. And what was interesting was everybody who wrote an article about it, there was one on IGN and there was one, I think, oh, some entertainment website that I can't remember. But each, each article had to spend a moment to explain why the show is problematic. It was almost like it was almost like their way of saying like, here, you know what, celebrating NYPD Blue, thirty years of the pilot, um, a show that really you know was a trailblazer, it changed the way television dramas were made, it won a ton of awards, and then there would always be it would get to that paragraph where it's just like, okay, well, we have to acknowledge that we can't fully support the show because it does some things that might offend you. We'll return after these messages. Hey, it's Brent Pope, the host of Breakfast with Brent Pope. You've seen me on some of your favorite TV shows saying things like, give it up, Jimmy, you got to sink this putt to win. On Breakfast with Brent Pope, I sit down with guests from the entertainment world and we do it all over breakfast. Or should I say breakfast? Every week on Breakfast, you get inside Hollywood info and tips, great breakfast wrecks and booty debates. Most of all, you get the most delightful 30 minutes of your week. So dig in, it's breakfast time. Listen at breakfast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always, am I the winner? Yeah, <laughs> not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America versus Darth Vader, Solid Snake versus the Iron Giant, classic matchups like RoboCop versus Terminator, and even the Muppets versus Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts, or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. <laughs> and I was like, guys, like, I, I feel like that's almost, and maybe it's just kind of a thing where you can't assume, but it's it's almost like something you have to assume about any show that's over 20 years old. Hell, even like 10 years old, where you're like, oh, the language has changed, the culture has changed, opinions have changed, and that's okay. It was a piece of art from that time. We don't have to distance ourselves from it while talking about it so that I people mean, don't people get are mad always going to stick this out, you know, even with the violence in society, because it's very much still a social commentary on that kind of thing. Mm. I, I don't understand why everything should just be tucked away and forgotten about, you know, if, especially when it was on the air for 12 years. Um, I, yeah. And, 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 and one thing that was crazy about these books that I didn't even realize until I uh, skimmed through them, the, the plot of these books are about organized crime. Yeah. Um, uh, well, it seems it's it seems awful to say child pornography and the adult inter entertainment business mm -hmm. it's also yep. a, it's also it's also about internal affairs and corrupt cops and it's about wealthy getting away with a murder or covering up a murder mm -hmm. and all of that is still things that we are dealing with as a society today yeah it, it's it's not like those things are buried in the past. It's just the language used to talk about those things are now buried in the past and are considered a faux pas. But it's like, these are still, an, this is still an issue that we need to, we need to talk about and work through. We don't need to talk about the way <laughs> Sipowitz describes a gay man in the book, which is not very nice. Um, I can agree. It's not nice. It's kind of uncool. But, he said that as an off-color joke when he was talking about a man that was trying to murder him and his wife, um, who was paid by an organized crime boss to be to murder them. So it's like we can focus on the things that'll upset you, or we can adjust knowing that was the time it was made and move forward. And I think uh I don't know, I, I think that's what our podcast kind of hopes to do in some ways. Um, 
lets you enjoy something that may have things about it that are not really appropriate for the time, but it's still a good piece of work. Well, um, and at least this character, uh, you know, has their flaws examined instead of just letting them continually get away with murder, you know, like we seem to want oh, all these yeah. other characters to do nowadays, and it's frustrating. Oh, yeah. There, there was, there was a, there was a line that I almost wanted to like highlight in the book because <laughs> it was so funny. Where, um, because these two books highlight characters on the show, and since the show lo- lasted so long, some of those characters are not around by the time yeah. you get to halfway through the halfway through the series. But one of the characters that has a brief interaction is uh, John Irving, who is the civilian. Um, aid oh, to, yeah, yeah, the, to the receptionist, yeah. And John Irvin is a gay man, and in the book, it's literally written: Sipowitz fights his homophobic urges to allow John to give him free haircuts from time to time. Yeah, and it was like, it was like, holy shit! It's just outlining that, yeah, his character is a homophobe, but he likes the benefits of getting free haircuts. And he's learning to accept John very, very slowly. And then by the end of that series, if you watch the show, mm-hmm. John is his like his main babysitter. Uh, him and John are very close. Um, and they've been through crazy things together. And it's it's just crazy because it's like, yeah, if you read that, you'd be like, wow, what a bastard. It says he's a homophobe and uses this gay man for free haircuts. And it's like, yeah, but watch about seven more seasons after that point <laughs> and see where he is with John um, and with uh, other people in his life. It's a very, very different man. Um, <laughs> it's it's crazy, a different but it's man, different time. <laughs> <laughs> but him, him examining that and getting better, it's, it's, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Totally. Hey, and... Uh, hopefully we can keep discovering some of this old media and just not have it be lost to time. Uh, there's these great uh, podcasters, Jeff Akin and company, who, uh, you know, they have all these different Star Trek podcasts, including Starship Leadership and The Greatest Generation, but they have started their own podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. And it's just so <laughs> funny seeing them talk about this show that, you know, Babylon 5, which is share some of these same cast members but kind of like you they're looking at a 90s show that they just unfortunately <laughs> they heard about but never saw and they're looking at it with modern day eyes and i think it's very awesome because they kind of came into it with my same eyes like hey okay so it's really no different than Battlestar and star wars and track and all these other space operas it's just you got to be a little patient some of the marines kind of feel like aliens and predator kind of knockoffs and <laughs> um obviously the graphics didn't hold up but you forgive it because it's a tv show and the plot is engaging enough that you have to kind of just let the roger corman-esque you know schlocky look just kind of go with it you know it's and uh unfortunately the hardest thing to do is to introduce people to it because like any show it's going to start off rough or it's going to get your attention mm-hmm. but still have some cheesy moments <laughs> Oh yeah, like it, it's it, we've uh, as a society we've kind of become almost we've become just a collection of the things we consume because everything yes, is so that is the best way like, to put it. <laughs> so like ev- like every single thing we consume is like documented in some way. So it's like, oh, I have a letterbox. Oh, I mentioned that on Instagram. Oh, look, and me and me be a snob on here. Yeah. And so, and so, when when you when you uh, refer somebody to your favorite show, or you suggest your favorite show, it does reveal something about yourself. And what's so fun is like, people go like, "You what show?" And like NYPD Blue, you may have never heard of it. It's one of the best shows ever made. Um, and then they start watching it, and they're like, "You like this show with all the the cursing and the weird racial slurs and this." And I'm like, yeah, but it gets really, really good, and it's a really well-written story. And they're like, well, what are your other favorite shows? And I'm like, well, South Park. 
which kind of does the same thing um, <laughs> with children yeah. in animated form. And then they're like, what What else? And I'm like, uh, it's always sunny, which that's also about really terrible people. I promise you we'll do an episode on it soon. But <laughs> yeah, like, no, that, that's a per- those are both perfect examples. Of, you can tell how many times people have actually seen it versus just casually witnessed it and saw. I mean, uh, I had this thing where my sister and I tried to get some relatives and our folks into Archer. And they kept seeing mm. one of the weaker, just more infamous episodes. And I was just like, well, I give up. You're you're yeah. not willing to spend the time. And I'm done explaining this yeah. shit to you. You know, and <laughs> and yeah. if you're not gonna give it a time of day, then just don't fucking bother. But that's that's where you gotta be. You you gotta set your foot down. Like I cannot for the life of me, to di- to various extenses. I can't stand Walking Dead. I can't st- stand Stranger Things. And I am not a <laughs> I mentioned horror story. I'm not a Ryan Murphy guy. And I am sure as hell not a yeah. Game of Thrones guy because the end, the last three seasons were just good, completely just uninvolving yeah. and it, it just made me go, why did I waste nearly a decade watching this uh, yeah. not well put together show? And yet you have to be ready to break it down and obviously some people will be forgiving uh but now it even makes me wonder you know you can always tell who's watching it versus who's actually examining it like who's watching like a marvel or star trek show for light entertainment versus actually engaging it and can break down Mm -hmm. the pros and cons and you just gotta be just leave it as it is it's like they're either gonna get complex or they're not and yeah, the, the, it, it's so fun. You mentioned Walking Dead because I stopped. I stopped at a very specific time. You're gonna. And it seems like it, it seems like no matter when you say you stopped, they'll say like, "Oh, but it gets better." And I'm like, "Well, yes." Oh my god. Okay. And and or I deny feel like, that it went downhill. Yeah, yeah, and, and I do feel like NYPD Blue comes out guns blazing. I think. Uh, always sunny to some extent but what is interesting is i think what happened to me was i got burned by a little show called lost i don't know if you watch lost (laughs) he is it pretty much goes like that i mean what we had one of our other recurring guests on to talk about the we love doing villain specials on tv shows and movies and Mm -hmm. we decided let's talk about uh the villains of the burn notice and we talked about all kinds of villains that really did kind of wreck their respective show. Like I like prison break. There's in fact, it's got a lot of the same actors as NYPD blue, but you know, I, I came into it after the fact, after the fandom had died down, after people could still couldn't agree or disagree on what was the best or worst season. And mm-hmm. I, but I, I pretty much came into it and said, okay, I'll watch this season again. Okay. That was okay. But I'm not going to watch that particular season again, but it was with 2019, 2018 eyes versus, you know, back when it was raw, fresh and new. And mm-hmm. you kind of do have to do a bit of that. And uh, one of my pals summed up, you know, walking dead's pretty much leaned on what plot device villain can we include? And the governor's kind of been criticized as that, you know, where you really don't under- get why, what makes him tick. Mm-hmm. And even when he gets his comeuppance with his eyes getting ripped out and everything, you're just like, still, I, I don't feel anything. <laughs> I don't feel yeah. satisfaction. I don't feel sorry in some capacity. Not that you should. I, it just feels like this is just becoming an, a really stupid exploitation movie on a big budget. <laughs> yeah, and and there, were, like the the specific thing that happened with Lost was I had never watched it. And then my buddy in college got all the DVDs as a gift because he was watching it religiously when it was oh, coming out go. on TV. <laughs> and, and he was like, do you want to do you want to watch him? And I was like, yeah, I've heard good things. My brother watches it. He kind of likes it. All right, whatever. <laughs> and so I turned it on and I was like, this show is pretty good. This show is pretty cool. And then it got to a point where I watched season three. I watched the DVDs of Lost season three in two days. <laughs> and that was like 24 episodes. And because I was just like, I got to keep watching, got to keep watching, got to keep watching. And then I was watching the the last season live 
on TV <laughs> with somebody else who had watched it the whole time. And we watched that final episode and we looked at each other and we were like, that sucked. And it also, it also had that thing where it, uh, the media started giving you like tidbits about shows. Oh, like too now, much. Before we had like people interacting on Twitter saying, hey, can you change that? And the writers take note. <laughs> yeah. So like, because right now, and it's one thing I kind of hate, um, and that just, it always makes me sound like a dude on the porch telling the kids to get off his lawn, but Ooh, I hate yeah. Like, I hate the fact that leaking details about your movie is now a part of your... So-and-so um, showed up at this? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a part of your advertisement for the movie to say, like, oh, we might do this. Much like the, the trailer said, it pulls a Deadpool and has shit that's not even in it. And no joke, the people who were making Lost at the time said... Hey, we just asked, uh, I think it was ABC. We just asked ABC if we could have our finale be two and a half hours. And I'm like, if they're asking for that, they're going to do some crazy stuff. So watching that two and a half hour finale and a whole lot of nothing interesting happened. And bulking and at it, what the hell? Yeah. And, and then it doesn't answer any of your questions. And you're just like, why did we waste all these years watching this? I have to do the same thing with Sopranos where I'm just like, people are trying to justify that final season. I'm like, no, 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 don't pull, don't go into Matt Weiner and company's bullshit. They did that to hurt you. That that's not acceptable. (laughs) They, they said, we don't like our fans. So we're going to give them a, you know, a shit sandwich. I'm like, why? And don't get me wrong. There are going to be times where you're going to just, I mean, you and I have done this with this NYPD Blue show, the, the same deal. I mean, I like 24 seasons that not everyone likes. I like I like all of Oz, and I know that's mm. sacrilege. Some people like to bitch at it midway for season four because of a key death, and I, I like kind of the sarcasticness, irony, and a lot of those other shows that are much like this, loosely connected to the St. Elsewhere Law and Order verse. But you got to just stand on your own two feet and say what you want without but i think people mistake that for wanting to be a dick or go on a rant it's like uh -uh, no i don't want the star wars (laughs) marvel dc fanboy i want you i want you to justify what you do and don't like uh i like later seasons in critical minds i think aisha tyler was wonderful and it got back to being what it had been in the first five years where it was an engaging anthology mixed in with action horror and mystery but uh, I, I, th- I think also a lot of people will mindlessly watch these shows just because they like the actor. And then once that actor inevitably is going to leave, because it's been, you know, so many years that then, then that's when the, the brick house comes tumbling down. Yeah. Oh yeah. But, um, and sci-fi and fantasy is definitely no, uh, no different. Uh, it's like, and this is before yeah. we were looking at Facebook and people were ha- posting spoilers and we were like, damn you, I haven't watched that episode yet. <laughs> yeah, you, you've mentioned Star Wars a couple of times. And, I, I can't not. And putting, your, <laughs> and, and putting your foot down. The moment I decided I'm not going to watch any Star Wars stuff, and it wasn't anything to do with Star Wars itself. It was the fact that I, I watched The Last Jedi. Mm-hmm. And I was talking with my friends about it, and everyone was super cool and cordial and nice to each other, and nobody was, like, angry. No just one like, threw you know, an action figure at you and became a five-year-old again. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. you can't say that. We, we, we were very much like, well, there were some things I didn't like. There were things I liked. I enjoyed this idea. I thought that was an odd choice. But I was also sitting there like, okay, you know, they they... they they swung for the fences, and some people are going to think they hit a home run, and other people are going to think they struck out. That's fine. But then I went online, <laughs> and I started reading what people were saying in the, like, the 45-minute diatribes about every aspect of that movie and talking about, oh, my gosh, we'll compare that to Force Awakens and then compare that to this and talk about this. And I was like, you know what? I, I think I'm, I'm just done with this all together you're examining with, I, like every uh, it's like if someone if a bunch of neighbors gather to for a party and one of them brings you cupcakes and the other bring you all that fancy 
you know, Baskin Robbins type shit. You know, it's just like, well, <laughs> apples and oranges. It's none of this is good for you. So why are we even here? And and I and I was like, okay, well, what is different between Star Wars and everything else? It's like everybody is so passionate and angry. And I mean, absolutely no offense when I say this, it's Star Wars. It's, yeah. It's a ripoff of samurai movies. I loved it all space. growing up, and I just kind of got to that point where it was like, <laughs> honestly, Star Wars is just beginner level. Like, that's hooked on phonics <laughs> level. That it, you, you should be, by this point, if that's all you watch, you'll never really, I find, be as developed a per, as a person. You've got to be able to go above and through and seek out all other kinds of content and material and get better with themes you know it's just the tip of the iceberg and i i see it with other people who some of these are internet trolls who only want everything to be kind of undeveloped or mindless and it's like well you're never going to get fully mindless sorry it's just not going to happen but yeah it's it's um because i i'm i'm for i'm for examining whatever you want to examine like i i did it with and and People laugh all the time. I did it with like Fast and Furious movies, oh, where it's like dear. just just examining like while it is absolutely. I promise you, I'll invite you to the ranking of that and, franchise. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's bonkers and terrible and just action fluff, but it is amazing to just look at how expertly crafted a very simple franchise it is. It, it's it's the I modern front. I don't think they even understand how it no. got so famous because it's a been rebooted like six times. And then it's kind of the best well-known. I don't like saying guilty pleasure because I don't, you shouldn't have to feel guilty about anything, but it is kind of that the most mainstream trashy franchise kind of like saw, oh, like yeah. you will see equal parts, people seeing it to hate watch it versus watch it in a mindless I always liked it kind of way and then it's, and then you get other people who are just they just want an excuse to go to the cinema with their date and that's going to be picked so it is I you yeah. never really know what kind of audience you're in with I mean it's kind of I, I mentioned Hellraiser earlier that's just another one where you're like you don't know how many hardcore Clive Barker you know sci-fi mm-hmm. horror guys you're going to get there versus people who only watch it for the content and then uh, I, I see a lot of the same with anything else from the terminator to it's just uh some other kind of friday night slugfest yeah I, you know i'm gonna see you know uh, these sequels to equalizer and expendables and i'm sure i'm gonna get equal parts fun <laughs> people who yeah. want to see 80s 90s influence movies as well as snobs in the audience who this is not here their cup of tea and you you really don't know until you take take yeah. the take the ride <laughs> uh, it's uh yeah it, it's just kind of the when you're like talking about like the franchises and the things you love and the things you're passionate about and comparing it to like that star wars reaction to the last jedi it was like guys you're allowed to just say i don't like this and you could still buy all the Star Wars branded stuff you want. You could still watch your old movies. Like a great example, while moving, I found we do have an original copy of the CBS Fox VHS Star Wars movies. Woo! <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, that's pretty cool because they don't even make these in this cut anymore. And yeah. and it's like, oh, this would be a cool thing to throw on and watch. I would enjoy watching this. This would be a fun time. But I feel like that's different than the person spending six hundred dollars on a fake lightsaber, uh, defending, and they'll only use it once. Um, and if you touch it, oh, I, I just want to have it just to be a dick about it. And I, I think somewhere we got to be able to vet who is where's that toxicity coming from, because it's not just yeah. parents who are working and leaving their kids. Uh, you know, it, it kind of goes back into the whole, you know. Why do crime rates happen? You know, they don't happen because of video games. They happen because of people using stuff in the wrong way, you know, for something else and not, you know, 
they don't know consideration because they've never been taught it. They've been left to their own devices, literally. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, I don't know, it's, to, and it's, it's so hard to, because you don't want to tell anybody to not enjoy things a certain way. But that's why, like the the catchphrase, the catchphrase, the like <laughs> the thing that the mantra I repeat on the stream is like, do what you like, but don't be a dick about it. Like, like if you come over, to, if you came over to my place, I have a ton of Lego. I have a ton of Lego sets. I love making Lego sets. I feel like it's a great way to de stress. And then at the end of it, sometimes that was what it was meant really cool. for. Instead of look who did like, a tie into this, you know, I always loved building our own characters, our own cities, our own buying custom, you know, add-ons for figurines. That those were fun. But like one 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 aspect of that is, I never buy a Star Wars set or a Marvel set or. Um, What's another one? You like uh, the support the of the Rings underdogs, sets. the independent ones remind them, hey, well, don't don't sell out. Don't do just tie-in. Yeah. Well and the main reason is, and it's very it's a very, I guess, kind of misery way to think about it, or someone very cheap, cheap skate way. To me, they're always gonna make a new Star Wars set. So if you buy yeah. Like if you buy that Millennium Falcon, they're gonna make six more Millennium Falcons before you die. But when they come out and they say, "Hey, we're making a bonsai tree," I'm like, "They may never make a bonsai tree again, and it looks pretty great. I'm gonna go buy that." But I'm never gonna buy the thing that I know that they have seven editions of, and I know they're gonna make more. But I'm never gonna shit on the guy that wants to buy the lego sets that are Star absolutely Wars, they want to build like that's what they want to build that's what it's they like want to people have go with their gut instinct it. which is always kind of an f you kind of response and it's like no and just you you speak ultimately with your wallet they are going to keep making yeah. a billion things that you either praise or want to bash but they're just going on mm. what where the check cleared and yeah uh, and so, you know, I, I did that this year where I was like done with superhero films, didn't like Guardians Free, didn't like The Flash. I've heard good stuff about Blue <laughs> Beetle, but I'm done for now. Obviously, inevitably, yeah. a comic book movie is still going to come my way. Someone might be playing Deadpool mm -hmm. Free at a house party. And I'm just like, OK, cool. But I got to take a break. And I've even talked to other podcasters who review comic book adaptations. And they're like, yeah, we're going to review some of the older stuff like The Rocketeer or uh, you know, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or <laughs> Constantine, just something that's always been kind of a cult <laughs> hit for better or worse, you know, and then we'll work our way up, you know, just let's let a decade go by first, you know, and that, those have been fun too, because they've examined a lot of lesser known animes and uh, manga adaptations, as well as just other movies, you know, like Judge Dredd, that will always be liked, the, the newer one, that Oh yeah, uh, and oh, but yeah. people forget is based on a comic after a while, and uh, that's kind of where I try to find the halfway point here. I'm like, okay, how about I uh, read you these comics that you didn't know that are based on some of this Full Moon Entertainment stuff, as well as a better known <laughs> franchise. There's okay. a lot of great Terminator comics which uh, do a better job of showing that future world than any of the movies, arguably. So it's it. There's no limit to creativity unless you want to put up a barricade and i get that it's easier said than done i trust me it took me years to stop posting <laughs> remarks and realizing wow that came off as unintentionally hurtful or snobby or <laughs> yeah or you oh or just like a hot take <laughs> or like you just wanted to incite that hey i like it and you didn't even like the movie you know it's like don't unintentionally troll don't deliberately troll don't even just <laughs> Decide whether like, you want to even yeah. waste time on this for the next twenty minutes. You know, like because uh, like um we talked about uh like Letterbox and yeah like I use Letterbox and and what I tend to do is I I keep my reviews to like less than a sentence. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I, people are it, doing it, now. The sarcastic wit is kind of what they're going for. But, but like, because I, I know like if I if I talk into this, I'll keep going and. Like the ones that stick out in my mind are like, 
And for, for example, I went to see one of the Fast movies. I think it was nine. <laughs> and all I wrote was magnets. How the fuck do they work? Because <laughs> they use ma- they use magnets a lot, and magnets don't work like that. So I was like, as I was <laughs> as I was sitting there, like I could write an entire thing about the franchise has lost its mind. It now just fully embraces that reality is a constant <laughs> makeup on your own and yep. physics don't matter and facts don't matter and they really we're don't. just having fun or i could just say what like the, the thing i thought about while watching this movie which is just they don't understand magnets like they don't understand the basic the no. basic Why setup would of a magnet and they used it to make a pretty awesome action scene that makes absolutely no sense and yep. that's all i thought of like and then another one uh, that I I think it's my most liked review. Um, I reviewed the classic film Ernest in the Army. Meh. Um, and all I wrote was, yeah, it's basically the Hurt Locker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Hurt Locker who, ripped off Ernest in the Army. Perfect. One one because if anyone's ever watched both of those movies, they're like that's absurd. But two. It's like, what can I say about Ernest and the Army? Like, who cares? Like, I'm just acknowledging I watched it and thought it was funny. Oh, and um, you've already not... hit comedy gold. It's kind of <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the Hurt Locker. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it, to me, you can take that moment to shit on a movie. Um, you can <laughs> praise it for hours. But you're just asking for someone to comment and say something angry or disagree with you. And to me, it's like, hey... They want validation, but they don't even know why they yeah. want validation. It's like, just open the dialogue. To me, <laughs> yeah, for me, Letterbox is like, hey, I watched this movie. I either liked it or I didn't. Here's my quick thought about it. Uh, I don't want to get into a big discussion about it because... What's the point? Who's got that kind of time Yeah, <laughs> right now? Um I'll do that in person, um, or maybe on stream or on a podcast or something. Maybe but, I won't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, yeah, this has oh, been a delight. Uh, like to absolutely. say, you kind of take baby steps after a while. It's like, eh, shit. <laughs> but this is going to require way more time if we're going to break this down, you know. And I find oh, yeah. this also with podcasting. I'll see some people who clearly have a voice for it, but they don't for that or radio, but they're not sure they are as detailed. They're just too kind of like some of these creators. They're too close to what they're working on. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, yeah. trust me, you fill up the room. You have no idea. So I think if anything, we can just make each other more self-aware. We'll mm. just get, we'll grow, grow more as people, whether it's yes. talking to you about a music concert you just got back from or a carnival you took your kids to, you know, it's like that, that alone brought something out of you for better or worse, mm-hmm. but you learned the more you can work on yourself, the more you can help others. So. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think that's ultimately what I want from entertainment is like, Hey, yeah. You know, uh, th- there was plenty of times where I went to a movie event. I had zero interest in going, but it was just an excuse to go out of the house, spend time with brother and sister. And mm-hmm. it didn't matter that, you know, when on the drive home, brother was praising it and sister was bashing it. I was like, hey, it doesn't matter. I had zero interest in this. I'm just glad I got to hang out with you guys for two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just, just like going to the mall. Yeah. Um, and something, something else you mentioned, uh, just kind of about looking into other things and other mediums. That's yep. one of the cool things about watching um, public domain movies on oh, Twitch. Yes. Like, because what I tried to do this month, because right now we're recording in October. Right now I'm doing only horror movies, but I usually do, I usually do a horror movie. Uh, Yeah, I I usually do like a horror movie or sci-fi movie, and then next week I'll do a drama or a comedy. Like I try to go up, like back and forth. But sometimes you you can find some movies that have just been forgotten to time (laughs) that are really good in their own ways Mm -hmm. and the only reason no one's ever watched them is just because it was made in 1956 and the copyright is lost and nobody knows about it 
but some hey. people on the internet just threw it up. And so it's great. <laughs> Someone took up his <laughs> stash. The the online community who loves public domain movies was like, well, we got to get this ripped to the internet, and they uh, they get it out to you. It's it's really cool. It's a great way to find new things for free. Um, you lose nothing. Sure, lose you lose nothing at all. It was time, but you, you got to be prepared for that anyway. I will see so many people say, I want my time back. I'm like, then spend it wisely. <laughs> yeah. So just being this... angry all the time. Well, you <laughs> chose to put that on, you dipshit. <laughs> and, and something I've something I've said to people, because I, I enjoy watching a bad movie, just like a good movie. And they say, how could you watch bad movies? And I say, yeah. a bad movie... A bad movie shows you what you like about good movies. Correct. And maybe you need a little more Elvira, Joe Bob, uh, Svengoolie, <laughs> Mystery Science Theater in your life, you know. But yeah, mm -hmm. it, it is a good intro to where it's like half your ideas that we see in a movie or show might, you know, I, I, I love it when the critic breaks down uh, something in a movie saying this would probably work better as a CSI episode or this would have been better <laughs> as a mini series or I might have liked it better as a shameless B pitcher because then I could forgive the flaws but mm -hmm. there was no that that wasn't the case here this had no reason to be this poorly developed plot wise and have I mean half the time I was I think I was just very B movie savvy because half the time you would see a mainstream movie and you would be like, well, that wasn't much different than a, you know, Skinamax thriller or a <laughs> stupid sci-fi channel movie, but it had five times the budget and a big name actor mm -hmm. fighting the creature. So I guess it's what's otherwise a generic, what could be a Roger Corman-esque creature feature of the 50s uh, became the newest, you know, box office flop, you know, but it was shinier. You know? <laughs> yeah. But it's the oldest yeah, trick in the book, you know. Let the cat out of the bag. You know? Yeah, I, I I also watched Jurassic World in theaters. I know what oh. you're talking about. Oh um, uh, yeah, and I I think <laughs> that, that that also those in Terminator Genesis or as Genesis <laughs> as I call it, right. this kind of came in at the awkward time where everyone was trying to do a forced kind of homage, and I was like. Oh and yeah, I feel like people have even soured on what is a homage anymore, and it's like versus a tribute. And I'm like, and people are doing this with the Orville now, and I'm like, yes, you know, it's it's all the above. It's <laughs> it's a mixed bag of everything. Yeah, I, I mean, Tarantino is another one who drives people crazy to where I'm like, what? What are we doing here, guys? I think I think Jurassic World in the theater was the last time I got that like what's what's a way to describe it that like impotent rage that you might get at a movie oh just, and it, it burns you after like, a while where you're like oh yeah well i made i made the mistake i watched jurassic park before seeing it so i was like you know what dress world let me watch jurassic park this classic kind of timeless holds up in a weird way somehow it the does of film the sequels never figured and it then, out <laughs> And then, and then I watched Jurassic World, and as I left with my friend that I watched it with, I was like, that was horrible. That was a terrible movie. Um, it's also shitting on the legacy of, like, one of the best movies of all time. Yes. Worse than those sequels, worse than those sequels ever did. And they're like, no, it was fun. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, that was, that was really bad. And then I think that was another point where it was like, instead of getting angry and just, and shitting on it just mm -hmm. so you know what i'm not gonna watch any more of them <laughs> that, that i didn't enjoy it i'm not gonna see any sequels i'm not gonna watch it again yeah I'm we just... we briefly touched on those in a monster movie special talking about everything from anaconda to lake placid g plus c type oh, yeah. franchises and it is one of those where i'm like because there are plenty of other franchises where i only liked like the first or two you know, one to two movies, and then I could still find something to talk about in the imperfect sequels. And that was one of those where I'm like, see, the sequels are such a blemish compared to the original. I, I just can't bring myself to do another constructive takedown on that particular franchise. So I won't, you know, and I think yeah. most people have, yeah. 
it's also kind of one of those most people have kind of already made up their mind on it to where mm-hmm. you, it's kind of even hard to talk about it passionately about for x amount of time so you kind of pretty much got to get to that point and you know there, it's kind of like when we're talking about stats and algorithms with all this different social media entertainment no one knows how it works so just go for it the sky's the <laughs> limit just keep doing it until you don't want to do it anymore instead of yeah well i guess i'm live i guess i'm on tv yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly exactly well the, you have no idea how much how forward i was looking forward to this and it's always a delight having you yeah. on here well, thank you. Uh, thank you very I, much. I, I, I'm just so tired of just hearing so many radio and satellite and uh, podcast shows where it just sounds like everyone just hates each other and just wants to get into a debate just to <laughs> make ratings. And so I love it when oh, people are actually yeah. engaging with each other and uh, doing yeah, things that, that uh... don't get anyone hurt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, <laughs> that TikTok trend is amazing. Where it's just two people, they disagree on something and go back and forth arguing. It's like, yeah, it's, <laughs> what what do you guys talk about? Um, <laughs> it seems like uh, you're arguing with the LTs. Why are you asking me? I'm yeah. insecure. I'm gonna put you down on social media. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, uh, all right. Um, but yeah, this is this has been a good time. Uh. <laughs> what were we talking about? We we're talking about books, um, right? You know, they... <laughs> Based on TV um, shows and seeing how they did. Yeah, yeah. You know, keep a the thing I always uh, leave people, uh, and I said it earlier: do what you like, be a dick about it, and keep uh, <laughs> keep exploring, keep exploring. Uh, you know, new mediums. Like I, this one also makes me sad. It always makes me sound weird. I don't always, I'm not reading all the time. What happens is get like a bug where it's just like, I want to read five Stephen King books and I don't know why. And then <laughs> I'll read them and then I won't read for like two years. And then all of a sudden I'll be like, huh. you know, I never read Lord of the Rings. Well, I'll read all those and The Hobbit <laughs> and then read this. And then, and then I'll, I, so this was a fun time because it was so close to, the show that I'm constantly making NYPD Blue Ball. So Woo. this is a good time. So thanks uh, thanks for having me having me good on. Time. Uh yeah, yeah. We we want to have just something kind of just uh to kind of just cling on to. And you y- you will see some people where it's just like they want to just kind of complain for the hell of it. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. what are we doing here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for thanks again. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up.